Tonight, we are talking about Quincy's fabulous trees. Uh, and we have some experts, uh, local experts and uh, regional and scientific experts. We have a whole bunch of different folks that uh, Maggie McKee from QCAN will be uh, introducing here in just a couple minutes. But I, I get the honor uh, to introduce and, and welcome you all first. My name is Clayton Cheever. I'm the assistant director at the Thomas Crane Public Library here in Quincy, Massachusetts. And I will be helping facilitate this evening. Um, I'll mostly be in the background because we have lots of other people that you're really, I know, all here to hear, uh, to, to welcome and to hear. Um, but I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to welcome you all. Without further ado for me, I'm going to turn off my spotlight and pass it to Maggie. Maggie, it's so great to have you here. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Maggie McKee, and I'm a member of a new Quincy Tree Committee, which is a citizen led group that is dedicated to preserving and expanding Quincy's urban forest. Um, we're just taking root, and I'm grateful for the organizations that are co sponsoring tonight, including the library, which has amazing resources on trees for kids and adults, Quincy for Transformative Changes, Environmental Justice uh, Task Force, and the Four River Residents Against the Compressor Station. Um, so QCAN, just to go through the co-sponsors a little bit, QCAN supports protecting our urban canopy because trees, especially mature trees, um, um, sucking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which heats up the planet. And um, so they suck that in and then they just store it as wood. Um, and um, Quincy for Transformative Changes, um, Environmental Justice Task Force wants to reduce on communities of color in Quincy and to ensure that the benefits of trees um, which we'll hear about tonight, extend to everyone here. You're also welcome to come to QCAN meetings there the second Wednesday of the month, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and um, finally, FRAX has been fighting for years to stop the installation of a natural gas compressor station in um, the station, which was recently built but hasn't yet started operating regularly yet. Um, has already um, resulted in the clear cutting of trees on the site and the harm to local trees will only worsen in the future because um, natural leaks, which happen frequently at compressor stations, um, kill trees. So um, you can visit the site in the uh, chat to visit FRAX. Um, so now onto our panel. I'm so grateful for the panelists joining us tonight. Um, we have three amazing tree experts. Um, the first is Pamela Templer. Um, she is a biologist at Boston University and she studies um, how climate change affects New England's forests. Um, next, Erin Lerman, an urban forest at the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, who will talk about a, a tree giveaway program that the state runs, um, including in Quincy. And then last but not least, we have Chris Hayward, who is our tree warden here in Quincy. So we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, so I think each of them will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. Without further ado, I will pass it on to Pam Templer. Thank you so much, Pam, for, um, for being here. Thank you, Maggie, so much for inviting me, and it's great to be here. It's nice to see all of you. Um, I have to say one of my favorite parts of getting on a Zoom is seeing everyone's backgrounds, and I've seen kids in high chairs. I've seen animals walking by, and it's great. I wish this was truly in person, but nothing beats that. So I'm just going to give a very brief presentation. Uh, Maggie asked me to speak about the benefits of trees in forests and cities. Um, as she said, I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at Boston University, and I direct our Biogeoscience and Urban PhD programs. And I'm showing you two photographs here. Um, the top one is at New Hampshire, where we do a lot of work. The bottom right picture is at Boston University, right along the Charles River. And I, what I wanted to first share with you are some of the benefits of trees in their natural environments in forests. And this is a map of the globe. And my point here is just to share how common forests are around the globe. They make up about 31% of our land area across the world. Um, and they do a lot of different things that are super important to benefit all of us. So they help create jobs. The trees themselves produce oxygen that we breathe. They muffle noise because trees do such a good job taking up water as well as having roots that hold onto the soil. Their habitats for animals, microbes, and 
other plants like epiphytes. They contain about 70% of the carbon that's present in living things on earth. And that's really important. Probably many of you are familiar, but just in case you're not, we're doing a really good job of pumping carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This is known as the Keeling curve, and it's just showing you concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last several years. And you can see that they're rising. And they're rising because you and I are burning fossil fuels um, at electrical power plants. We're cutting down forests. And of course, we're driving cars and doing other things to pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and this is leading directly to climate change. So what I'm showing you here is this black line is just a smooth line for CO2 that's been rising over the last several decades. And on the y-axis, I'm just showing you global temperatures. Um, and this is relative to the long-term mean. So blue just means colder than the long-term average and red means warmer. And of course, our temperatures have been warming. But one thing to keep in mind is that Earth's biosphere, so that's just basically trees, soils, um, and everything in them basically can offset up to about 30% of our emissions of carbon dioxide. So what that means is that if we didn't have all that great green stuff across the globe sucking up carbon dioxide, we'd have even more of it up in the atmosphere leading to climate change. And so for those of you not familiar with this, um, that's just what we learned in elementary school and middle school that plants do photosynthesis, right? They take up CO2, they use it, they assimilate it, they fix it into sugars that you and I get to eat. Um, but that process alone, carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. And so that's a really important thing to think about with forests. But on the other hand, one thing that's not so good is that we're losing many trees and their ecosystems to deforestation, while at the same time, we're getting some reforestation, but that's not enough. And so that's why I come to cities. I just want to talk to you a little bit about why it's important not to just study trees in forests, but also within cities themselves. And so why are urban trees important? Um, we know that cities themselves don't make up a huge amount of land cover across the globe. They're only about 2% of our land area, but it's where the majority of the human population lives. So if you look across the whole globe, more than 50% of us live in cities, and that's even higher if you just look within the United States. So if you care about trees, we wanna look at where the people are as well. And the good thing is that trees can benefit all of us um, in cities. So it's estimated that on average, if a tree cost $50 to $600 a tree to plant, they can provide up to something like $90,000 in benefits. They do things like improve street safety by creating um, a clear street edge. So as drivers are going down the street, they know where the pedestrians are likely to be and they could stay clear of them. They can actually calm traffic and reduce road rage. They also improve drainage because just like in forest, trees take up water and their roots stabilize soils. So that's a great way to cut down on local flooding. And they also filter our air and reduce air pollution, um, such as particulates as well as ozone, that if they're left in the air can lead to things like cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. So as I mentioned earlier, can mitigate climate change. So just like in a natural forest, trees in a city can help to offset the greenhouse gas emissions we're all responsible for by removing some of that carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. And they also can directly offset what we call urban heat islands. That's just the phenomenon where cities tend to be warmer than their nearby rural areas, but the trees themselves can lower temperatures, not just through shade, but through the process of evapotranspiration. So every time, you know, during the day the sun comes out, they open their stomates, they take up water, and through that evaporative process, that can also contribute to local cooling, which is really important because that extreme heat events are the number one cause of climate-related mortality in the United States. And so I've shared with you the benefits of trees, um, but now I'll just argue that we need to do something to protect them. It's not enough to just value them, but we need to think about what we need to do to help them. And so we can't just plant trees in a city and walk away vulnerable when they're youngest. So if you just plant a seedling and pray that they, they grow up to be big adult trees, that doesn't always work. Um, in fact, about a year and a half ago, the Boston Globe ran this story, urban forests are crucial for combating climate change, but planting more trees is easier said than done. So clearly we can't just plant a tree and walk away with it. And we also need to consider what harms them. Um, and so what I thought I would do in the last couple minutes I have remaining is just share with you very briefly um, what our group does to study the effects of climate change. We also study how air pollution affects trees as well as introduce insects. And so with climate change, um, I know all of you now know that the climate is changing, but what some of you might not be familiar with is that winter is changing more extremely than other seasons of the year, especially in high latitude places like New England. Um, and that's basically leading to winters with less snow. So this was just about a year ago when the headline in the Boston Globe was, there's been no winter in winter. And I haven't seen that headline yet this year, but I've been hearing about it a lot when you talk to people on the street. Where did winter go? We got a dusting of snow today, but, but it didn't accumulate. Or I guess it, it stayed on the ground for a little while and then it, it mostly disappeared. Um, but it looks like we might be in for another winter like this. But even if it snows a lot later, the long-term trend is that our winters are getting less and less snow. 
And so what I'm showing you here is what we now know is that the consequences of a smaller snowpack. So in a warmer winter, you and I might like it because we don't have to wear as many hats and gloves, um, but forests themselves and trees and cities don't like that so much because the snow can act as an insulating blanket. Expression, look at that beautiful blanket of snow um, that actually has biological meaning because the snow is a great insulator. So when it's on the ground, the soils beneath it are less likely to freeze. That's in contrast to what I'm showing you on the right. On the right, I'm showing you where there's less snow, mild winter, um, where you, you and I might consider it mild temperatures, less snow, more soil freezing, and the trees and everybody who lives in the soil doesn't like it. Um, and so basically, we know now more and more that snow is a really great insulator. And while people have known for thousands of years that the snow um, is really a great insulator, as indigenous people have known, biologists are increasingly recognizing why that's so important. So all I was gonna say is that we need to be aware that things like climate change are affecting our trees. And it's not just the hot temperatures of summer, it's also the shrinking snowpack in winter. We mountains can really damage trees. And while we can use trees as sponges to take up those pollutants and get them out of the air so you and I don't breathe them, um, we need to also be aware that trees are sensitive to those pollutants as well. And I was just gonna mention introduced insects. Um, probably many of you are familiar with the fact that Many insects have come into New England. As well. We now have the hemlock woolly adelgid, we have beech bark disease, emerald ash borer, we've got the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and we all just need to be really cognizant of the fact that when we get you know, non-native insect species in an area, that it could really be damaging. We're likely to lose Eastern hemlock trees um, in the not too distant future. People are very concerned about ash trees. And of course, everyone's worried about um, sugar maples with the Asian longhorn beetle. And so I was just gonna end my talk by just saying that um, it's really wonderful to study trees. It's really good to know about their benefits, but if we don't do stuff to protect them, whether it's in a city, by managing them, keeping them healthy, keeping them protected, we're gonna lose them. Um, and so I'll end it there. Hi everybody, my name is Aaron Lerman and I'm a forester with the uh, DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Uh, it's probably more well known to most of you guys as the folks, the State Department who runs the uh, beaches and parks and pools, Walston Beach, of course. We also have all urban and community forestry departments uh, within the DCR called uh, well, it's Urban Community Forestry. And our program, Greening the Gateway Cities, within it is a tree planting program. And uh, I am the forester here representing uh, planting in Quincy. We have state planting in other cities. Uh, but um, I'm the only one here in Quincy. I hire a, a crew seasonally. There's a photo of us uh, on the right. There's me and a, a couple of my crew members planting um, one of the trees, I think, in 2018, pre-pandemic, pre-mask. Um, so our, a little bit about our program. We are uh, funded by a, a few state departments. We're under the uh, broader umbrella of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, but we received some support from the uh, Department of Energy Resources and the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, so, so far in Quincy, um, up on the left there shows our overall planting so far, 1,343 trees in the last few years. Um, each one of those dots is one of the trees and we'll get into a little bit about where we're planting and why, but that's uh, a nice little overview of uh, where we're planting and hopefully we try and fill those boundaries with as many dots as, as we possibly can. Uh, so on the most basic level, our tree program is uh, a tree giveaway and planting. So um, I meet with homeowners and residents and renters and business owners and whoever. And if you live within our zone, and I said before, we get to look at them again, um, people, residents, whoever get to choose a tree with my guidance. Uh, the final decision, of course, is, is whoever, uh, you know, whoever lives there, whoever's house it is, gets to decide what gets planted in their yard. But uh, you don't have to plant it yourself. Uh, I plant it along with the crew. We have a, a train crew that comes in and plants. We prioritize private spaces. Uh, the public domain is more of Chris's, uh, where Chris is working. Uh, so we like to go into backyards and front yards and side yards. Uh, trees are typically about six to 10 feet tall. Uh, this photo is uh, one of our earliest plantings in Quincy. This was a sweet gum we planted in uh, 2017, one of the early side, and it's uh, exceeded at six to 10 feet tall height. It's doing really well. These folks had a, a nice big maple that came down uh, uh, several years ago and really excited to replace the shade. And uh, we gave a really nice tree that they're doing a really nice job taking care of. So uh, briefly, Pam covered a lot of the benefits of trees. Um, you know, they really, we like to bring all these benefits right to the people in terms of cleaning the air and improving mental health and physical health, respiratory uh, diseases. Are, everyone's mind these days 
trees, uh, the original air purifier. Um, they reduce noise on the street. Uh, every, you know, the, the, the classic street that everyone kind of wants to live on is that picture on the top. Eight. You get to go for a walk and not be too hot. And so we're bringing that back to our gateway cities. The bottom picture was a planting that I did in Lawrence uh, a few years ago with these nice trees uh, on the little side yard of this house. And we put in five trees there and hopefully they develop some tree density, a little bit of shade and provide all those benefits to the people in that house and also across the street in those apartment buildings. So uh, I'll just go over some of the main questions that I, that I kind of get and help explain the program. A lot of people ask why we plant in only some neighborhoods and not the whole city or everywhere. And it would be wonderful if we could plant in every part of Quincy. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the funding to plant in every part of Quincy. It's just not possible to plant everywhere. Uh, so we focus on uh, environmental justice areas. Those are that's a, a federal designation that um, indicates uh, low-income, minority, or English as a second language uh, community. Um, this is a you know partly a response to redlining, which really put those folks into uh, areas of cities historically not invested in really. So the legacy of that disinvestment is maintained today and um, folks in those uh, categories often live in areas of cities that just don't have enough greenery, they don't have enough trees. So uh, we focus on those areas first, primarily those where we need trees the most. And then we're funded mostly, uh, even though trees have a bajillion benefits, we're really focused for the energy saving side of things. Um, our state has a really aggressive and really great uh, energy conservation policies as far as uh, energy efficiency uh, is concerned. And so we're a piece of that, our, our more well-known cousin, I would say, maybe uh, our distant cousin, the Mass Save program is also kind of in a, a similar category in terms of energy savings. But unlike Mass Save, which uh, is very short term, you replace a boiler or a light bulb and immediately you lose, use less energy. The trees uh, appreciate it over time and they uh, they start off slow and, you know, we start to see benefits 10, 15, 20 years down the line uh, where we're starting to see some real neighborhood changes. Uh, so our goal is we're trying to get uh, at least five trees uh, planted per acre uh, where it's possible. And that's going to help with sources of energy savings, which is uh, buffering winds um, and blocking the sun and, and creating some shade. And I, um, I don't need to be told, I, I get told a lot about the winds in Quincy. Uh, about how intense they are, and a lot of folks are really happy to get some uh, get some greenery in the way of that and help slow that down. So uh, on the left there, we use a program called iTree Landscape, uh, which is a U.S. Forest Service program uh, to prioritize uh, our high uh, high priority planting areas. So you can adjust for various factors. So prioritizing it that have low existing canopy coverage. Um, a, a lot of people, uh, so we can benefit a lot of folks, and also plantable space, which means we focus on really residential areas. Um, so the left there was kind of our analysis we worked with, and on the right, that got turned into our North Quincy slash Wollaston planting zone. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but circle over here. Uh, and then our Germantown Snug Harbor planting zone. Um, we got about 237 acres there, 700 in the North Quincy. So uh, total just under uh, 950 acres total, and uh, of course, 1434 trees planted uh, over the last few years. So, um, going into some of the challenges we face, uh, we deal with the built environment in, in the city here. Uh, we've got a map here uh, that has our impervious surface uh, surfaces in our North Quincy planting zone, and that is indicated by the red shading. So, the darker the red, the more more pavement, the more. Uh, uh, parking lot and sidewalk, et cetera. Uh, and then the green is where we planted before uh, in terms of density. So all those dots that uh, were on the previous map, that's uh, how successful we've been in sort of building density. So there's a little bit of a correlation here between uh, the planting in the least dense, or sorry, uh, uh, planting density in the lesser impervious surface area and lesser planting in the more impervious surface area because this is very difficult to plant when there's a lot of parking lot and building footprint, et cetera. But we look towards those those uh, yards where we can, um, you know, open up a little hole and we look to all sides of the house, front, back, side. Uh, we work a little bit with the city on tree belts and tree strips, not as much, but, but some. Uh, and then we also have been planted at public buildings like schools and libraries. Uh, so we look at those types of buildings in the built environment to get trees in the grounds. Um, we deal with some ecological and social challenges and opportunities. Here's our 
our, uh, our Germantown Snug Harbor planting zone. Uh, this is overlaid with a couple of different layers here. And so we've got our, our hurricane inundation layer as well as our trees planted. Um, that big area on the right side, that's Quincy Housing Authority. We started our program by planting 600 trees there. They had a lot of trees age out uh, of their landscape and tons of buildings that were just exposed to the elements. We planted a ton of trees there to really try and um, reinvigorate that, uh, that area. Um, and, but, you know, Quincy's on the ocean and we deal with these uh, very realistic, not just with the built environment, we have very sandy soils and um, we have flooding going on in areas, but, uh, you know, people still come to us and we try to help them out by getting trees and, um, you know, people want outdoor spaces more and more these days uh, and some privacy from the neighbors while they're, while they're out there. Um, they want to replace trees that came down in a storm 10 years ago or whatever, or last year. They need to just put a tree back. And as Pam mentioned before, uh, trees really help with flooding. So um, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Some folks think that evaporation is faster, but it's really trees move water uh, way faster than evaporation does. So um, trees there really help soak up water and also help keep water from dropping to the ground in the first place. Um, so for what trees we plant uh, in that area, um, I often like to talk about the trees in, in terms of categories, in terms of their shape, because the built environment has so many things going on between utility lines and sidewalks and gas lines um, and lines of sight uh, for safety. So I like to think about trees in terms of what it looks like and where we're planting it. So uh, vase-shaped trees to go over lines and over streets and stuff. Uh, tall, narrow trees where someone might not have a lot of space on their side yard and we get a narrow tree to go in for them. Uh, we like to use a, maybe a spreading or a pyramidal tree for, for screening uh, between backyards or whatever. And within those shapes, we designate three categories which are priority shade trees, uh, which are kind of what it sounds like. They're the, the biggest, the longest lived, longest lasting trees. The stuff we really wanna get in the landscape, um, it's gonna hopefully be there for a long time. And there's uh, a large tree is orders of magnitude um, more beneficial to the urban environment than a very small tree. Uh, so we try and prioritize the biggest trees that will fit in a space uh, without forcing it. And then we have our secondary consideration. These are the, the trees that they're maybe not the biggest, but, um, but they're still worthy of consideration. Um, and then they use sparingly. These are often the smallest uh, trees. Think of like a flowering cherry. They often don't live as long as a, a big oak. So we try and use them as, you know, as we can to fill in. Some spaces are just, they're just small. And so we need a small tree there. So uh, a few of the trees that we like to plant that we really love, um, this is what I would show somebody on a site visit when they, if they call or email, they uh, left a voicemail or something for a tree. And I met with them. Uh, we go on site and they say, I want a tree here. And I, you know, we have a conversation. And so some of the trees I like to show folks, uh, this black gum, also known as Tupelo, is one of our priority shade trees. Um, it's got that low branching, uh, which is great for screening. One of the greatest things about that I like about the Tupelo is that it does have some flood and salt tolerance. And so um, it also has a, a pretty wide range of habitat in terms of uh, heat and cold tolerance. Uh, so um, we've had some nice luck with it. It's got beautiful fall color. It's a native tree and um, it kind of does well a lot in a lot of the Quincy neighborhoods. We have we don't have the biggest lots in Quincy. Um, I have colleagues that plant in, in Haverhill where they've got a whole acre backyards and it's just, that's not what we're dealing with here. So uh, this kind of medium sized tree has done really well and is pretty popular. Uh, another one of these shade trees, it's a big, uh, beautiful, slow growing tree, uh, really ancient tree, it's been around forever, uh, like really millions of years. It uh, doesn't have a lot of pests uh, or, or disease problems. Um, and just a beautiful shape leaf, a incredible gold fall color, and really a very popular urban tree because of how rugged it is. Uh, and I'll show you one of our secondary consideration trees um, that our evergreens are all secondary consideration. Uh, they're very important for all the year round air uh, benefits, air quality benefits, and also wind screening, but they also, so we have to be very careful where we use them because blocking sun, like this time of year, uh, can actually drive up heating costs because people are getting the natural warmth uh, from the sun, even though that the limited hours of the day. So 
We have to be careful with uh, where we set our evergreens, but the Eastern Red is a popular one that we plant in, in Quincy, again, because of that, that coastal salt tolerance. It's really a, a nice coastal tree, beautiful uh, berries that uh, uh, cedar waxwings uh, and other birds like. So if you're into birds, beautiful tree, and I really like that shredded kind of looking cat scratch bark um, that I think is really cool. It has some neat reds and browns in there in the coloring. Uh, and then uh, probably the, one of the most popular used sparingly trees uh, that we plant is a choke cherry, which is another native tree. Uh, it's one of the only native cherries really around, uh, certainly the only native cherry that we plant. Beautiful um, purple leaves that the new ones uh, turn green and then the, the whole tree is kind of this purplish year round in the top left. It's got these beautiful white flower clusters, uh, a really great tree and cherries are one of the most uh, beneficial native cherries, one of the most beneficial for wildlife and for birds uh, that we have. So uh, another probably probably our most popular used sparingly tree and a really nice, nice tree to plant. Uh, so a lot of folks uh, think that trees are going to be a, a lot of work to take care of. And the truth is that they're a little bit, and uh, Chris certainly puts in a lot of work on when they get big on the streets, it's, it's a lot of work, but uh, in, the, in the backyard, um, and certainly when they're away from the stresses of being um, on the street, um, they're fairly easy. After we plant, the tree looks like, the base of that tree is going to look like that tree on the right with a little bit of a saucer shape to it. And you can see how the water settles in there and soaks into that root zone. So that's a design. Um, and we can, so uh, about, we, we ask folks to plant about 15 gallons uh, per week, or sorry, to water 15 gallons a week from spring to fall. So not this time of year. Uh, typically the ground is frozen. Um, and uh, we mulch, uh, we use a 333 red line uh, slide, and we keep it about three inches from the trunk. We don't want the, the mulch, but on top of the trunk, because uh, that can lead to rot and all kinds of bad stuff and bad root, uh, root stuff going on. Um, and then besides actively watering and then maintaining the mulch that we lay down, uh, one of the biggest things is protecting the tree, that is not actively harming it. So a lot of damage in young trees happens from weed whackers or mowers going right up against the trunk um, and cutting it. Uh, weed whackers over and over again, death by a thousand cuts kind of situation. It opens in pathogens. Um, and so not doing that or not tying chains around the tree or, or stuff like that, because as it, as it grows, it can get girdled. And that kind of happens a lot uh, more than maybe you'd think. I don't know, but more than it should or, um, we give every uh, person that we plant for a little pamphlet. Here's the, the back of it with a little bit more instructions on, on our watering, a little diagram or a little picture of just filling up that saucer with the hose and um, another uh, visual on the mulching, what not to do uh, with the volcano mulching, which is also fairly common. I don't know how it really got started in the industry. Um, somehow I think it got into the landscaping side of things and people do it, but it, it's not good. It, messes up the trunk, uh, messes up the roots. It can lead to all problems and kill the tree. And again, um, you know, just keep it outside that little circle that we plant and helping things out a little bit. So uh, we'd love to plant for you. So get your free tree or free trees. We, you're not limited to one. As you saw, there's a couple of places that had more than one tree. Uh, you can, as many trees as fit uh, in your yard, as many trees as you want to water uh, and haul the hose out to, uh, we are happy to plant. We have a voicemail hotline you can leave a message with. You can look us up online there and type in your address and see where you land in our zone and send me a message right from there. It goes right to my email. Um, and just wanted to end with a little quote. Uh, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And uh, so think about that as we plant uh, some of our trees like the one on the right over at Quincy House near 30, that beautiful cherry, which seems to have grown by, by feet in the last couple of years. So, um, that's kind of all I got, a little overview of our program and getting trees in the ground. And um, I think I will um, thank you everyone for listening and pass it on to Chris. Yeah, so I'm your new tree warden. Uh, I've been here on the job for about a year. So everything that you just heard from Pamela and Aaron and some of the stuff you heard from Maggie, I'm the guy. <laughs> I'm the guy here in Quincy that's trying to take all that great information right there and throw it right into our urban forest. Um, not the easiest thing to do, unfortunately, but uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what I've got going on in my world here. So I've seen a couple people uh, chatting in and asking questions a little bit. 
one of the biggest reasons I'm here is because in Massachusetts, we have the Public Shade Tree Act. Under Massachusetts General Laws, it's Chapter 87. You can go take a look at it. It's a little bit of an outdated law, but it's still current. And the fact of the matter is that's what uh, governs me and governing the urban forest and the things that I'm allowed to do in the urban forest and the, the things I shouldn't be doing in the urban forest. And, but the biggest thing is it's about caring for the trees. And the first thing that I want for anything in the urban forest is it to be safe for the public. Public safety is my number one concern by far. Because when you take a forest and you bring it into a very popu you know, densely populated area, things can happen, unfortunately. And I'm sure that you, uh, many of you have seen things happen. Um, so my job is to be out there on the streets and making sure that none of that is happening. Branches falling down, trees dying, trees blowing over. Uh, all bets are off in a hurricane. Not much I can do about that. Mother Nature's got a little bit more uh, than Chapter 87 in her back pocket. But um, So I'm governed by the Public Shade Tree Act. Um, one of the things that I have the power to do that no one else really does in the city is to remove trees. And I know a lot of people think that when they see me coming down the road, my job is to just cut down a tree. That's not my job at all. My job is to cut down the trees that need to be cut down. The ones that are questionable, the ones that maybe I don't understand if the, maybe the public won't understand whether they should be removed or not. We have a tree hearing under the, under the chapter 87 public shade tree act, there's a, a, an option there for having a tree hearing so that I can bring to light uh, and a, a, the attention of the public why this tree is either being requested for removal, maybe it's being requested by me, but I just don't think that the public understands why it's coming down. It looks like a perfectly fine tree, but there may be something me as a certified arborist in Massachusetts recognize this could be a serious problem. So we have uh, um, tree hearings. And those are advertised for two consecutive weeks in a local newspaper, either the Patriot Ledger or the Quincy Sun. Uh, they're also advertised through the clerk's office on the clerk's website. They're advertised through the forestry page. Uh, we put a notice on the tree seven days in advance of that hearing. Um, the public can come out anywhere. It doesn't matter where you live within the city. Um, you know, someone in Squantum could read about a tree hearing that's taking place for a tree over on Howe's Neck. You're part of this community. You can come out and you can comment. Uh, nowadays, unfortunately, we're all commenting like this digitally, but you can send me an email before that hearing. If you object to the tree's removal for whatever reason, you want to give me that reason, that'll be part of the become part of the public record. So this is just a little something that one little piece I do and be more than happy to uh, talk to anybody about. But I don't really want to talk so much about cutting down trees. I like to talk about just maintaining trees and keeping the health of our urban forest uh, as best as possible. When I first took this job, I, I was coming from Watertown, north of Boston, a much smaller community very involved in their trees, very, uh, took their tree uh, urban forest very, uh, um, very importantly. Uh, when I got here to Quincy, it was like three times as big. And the trees in many cases are three times as big. What a supply of trees here in Quincy. They're unbelievable. The amount of trees, somebody had a great plan a hundred years ago. I mean, depending on what the, the, the landscape was at that time, I know a lot of, you know, um, uh, farms and agriculture and things like that. And maybe even in, for instance, salt marshes that had to be filled or whatever, but oaks were planted all over town and we've got just impressive oaks all over town. But unfortunately those trees, as they age, they need to be maintained. Uh, just with all the things that Pamela mentioned and Aaron mentioned about the mulching and the weed whackers and the, and the, there's, there's the salt and there's the urban environment where there's so much going on. And every time, you know, we have a power outage, a new pole's got to go in or we have a, a, a stormwater, a, a, a water main break, you know, a, a hole has to be dug in the ground. And our trees' roots, that's where they're spreading. There's so much of the trees that are underground that we don't see that every time we put a hole in the ground, we're, we're actually affecting these trees and these bigger oaks are really taking the beating of it over the years and they're starting to show that. Uh, and you know, the lightest winds were losing branches here and there and, and some of them can be pretty big branches. So my job is to make, get out there and, and analyze that tree, inspect it, and then get my crews out there. And we're limited in our resources with crews, but get out there to protect that tree and keep it for as long as possible. Uh, it's such an important thing. So managing the care and the health of our urban forest is one of the biggest parts of my job. Uh, when I'm out there, I'm creating work orders based off of those risk assessments. Uh, I mentioned that I'm a certified arborist, so annually I have to take all kinds of seminars and courses to keep up my, 
my level of credits, my level of education. So that because a tree isn't like putting a fire hydrant in, putting a telephone pole, putting in a catch basin, because a tree is a living thing, it changes over time. And, and not only that, but where rust likes to eat a uh, hydrant and maybe termites like to eat a telephone pole, there are many different little things that like to eat trees like Asian longhorn beetles that Pamela mentioned. I, I carry this around in my pocket just to remind myself that there are things that are just coming around all the time trying to eat and destroy what I'm trying to take care of. So I'm uh, creating work orders and giving those to my guys to get out and prune off a broken branch that it could allow in decay and, and maybe, um, you know, prune off this particular branch because it, it, you know, the way the tree has grown based on its location and it's, you know, being stunted by one thing or being, you know, pushed off by something else that we can get a direction to go for this tree to keep its health uh, as best as possible. So some of the things I do, a uh, big part of my job every day is to communicate with the public. I meet with individual residents to alleviate their concerns Sometimes, unfortunately, I might not be able to alleviate your concern just because you have leaves in your gutter. I'm sorry, not much I can do about that. But there are other things that I can do, such as maybe a branch has got, uh, got you concerned that you're seeing get closer to your house during every rainstorm. I might, be able to, I might be able to work with you on that and clean that branch up for you and make it so that that tree doesn't cause you the concern. You live with that tree more than I do. I'm in charge of it, but the tree, I really like to put myself in your shoes so that you understand I know where you're coming from I know what the concerns are I'll try to help you out as best I can so I'm meeting with residents all the time phone calls every day emails all the time I'm still meeting out on the streets six feet distance all right of course but wearing my mask but we're always talking and I'm, I'm always uh, open to uh, discussion with many residents uh, another thing that I do is when I'm going around and I'm removing trees I'm thinking ahead and thinking What's the next best tree that we can put in this location? I'm looking at all the, the obstacles and the conflicts I've got and what's the right tree for that place and work with the resident to make sure that, you know, we put this back here that maybe you'll be able to help me out. Just a little bit of water here and there. I'm not looking for much, but just a little bit of TLC and that tree will really be able to thrive. One of our mottos in this business is the right tree in the right place. I think Pam might have mentioned that you don't want to just be putting trees all over the place, just planting them all over the place. You want to make sure that you're putting them in the right place in the urban forest so that we can have them for as long as possible. So I do a lot of plant planning for the planting of public trees with my boss, the Commission of Natural Resource, our project manager, who's out about out and about and dealing with a lot of residents just like myself, trying to get that right tree in the right place. So we do that an awful lot. We're working on it right now. In fact, in the, in the cold of January, we're planning for our spring planting. Um, I work with many different departments throughout the municip municipal government, uh, notably DPW. So when the DPW comes to my office and they say, hey, Chris, you know, we're going to be building or reconstructing eight new roads this year. And, you know, we've got some problems with some sidewalks. Can you come out and you know, take a look at these trees with us? So I go out in the streets with the engineers and consultants, and we try to come to the best fit that we possibly can to make sure that the tree is safe and that the sidewalks go in that so that people can make their way around the community without tripping hazards and low branches in their faces. So we try to work together. I work with many different departments, uh, fire department, uh, not so much here in Quincy yet, but in the past I've worked with uh, uh, in my prior job with the fire department, when utility companies and their wires get too close to the trees, if they're not pruned appropriately, we can actually have fires. So I work with the, 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 uh, the fire department. Speaking of the utility uh, companies that come through, I'm always working with them. I have a, uh, a quick line right to National Grid right now to talk with them about problems that I may have with um, you know, trees and wire conflicts. Or uh, for instance, I just had to have a tree, a large tree that had uh, a decayed trunk that our crew wouldn't be able to handle because it was all tied up in transformers and, and power wires and, and Everso uh, Eversource. I used to work with Eversource, so forgive me for any National Grid folks that may be listening. Uh, National Grid here in, uh, in uh, Quincy. The, they worked with me. They came out. They cleared around that transformer so that my crew could go in there and work safely to remove that high-risk tree so that we can get a new tree into that location sometime in the future. So I work with utility companies constantly. I'm always working with them, always trying to ensure the best management practices when they come into town. Uh, just trying, you know, a lot of times uh, you'll see trees that look kind of like goalposts and not really the way a tree wants to be. A tree, tree you see how everyone knows that what a tree looks like when it grows. It wants to be full and 
you know, the more branches a tree can have, the more ability it has to capture that sunlight to, you know, photosynthesize, create those sugars that it needs to survive. The more branches we take out of a tree, the faster we're putting that tree away, uh, we'll be cutting it down. So the best I can work with uh, utility companies to make sure that they're taking what they need, but not more than they need, then we're better off. And then again, back to the old uh, saying of the right tree in the right place, making sure that the next tree that goes in doesn't have that same type of thing. My goal right now is, and I work in the business where uh, everything I do right now, nobody really sees unless I'm cutting down trees. But when I'm planting, nobody's really going to know about it or be really appreciative of it for about 20 years. So uh, maybe about 20 years, I may just be on the brink of retirement. So whoever's going to get that tree warden job now, I want them to be the most psyched tree warden coming in here saying, wow, this guy left something really nice for us. So that's a, a big part of my job. Um, Maggie had um, asked me a couple questions here. That, let me just see if I can. Uh, so what should residents do if they see electric company or city employees working on trees? Most of the time, just leave them, leave them alone. Uh, tree work is very dangerous work. If you could just kind of keep them, you know, out there in the trees. But if you have a concern, call ahead. Call down. we we'll likely know what's going on. And if we don't, we can get a guy or myself out there to figure out what's going on. But I'd really rather just have you not be around. Tree work is very dangerous dropping branches, machinery that is like the meanest stuff on the planet. So rather just have you stay away from that. What should people do in our office? I'd be more than happy to come out and talk with you if you've got any kind of concerns. Should residents do anything to take care of tree trees? The biggest thing you can do is a little bit of water in the dry time. This past summer, we had a pretty good drought. We won't really feel the effects of that drought for probably a couple of years, but you'll start to see some tree damage, I'm sure. Um, but for the smaller trees, I'm not talking about the big mature trees, some of the smaller trees that Aaron's planting, some of the newer trees that the city plants, a little bit of water, five gallons a week, that could go an awful long way for the survival of that tree. Um, the other thing is, if you could, if you did, did your best to, try not to park on its roots. I know it's tough in an urban environment when, you know, we all want to have our car in a, you know, a strategically close place. But uh, if you pull up over the curb and you're on that tree's roots, it's basically like someone coming and stepping on your foot overnight. You're not going to be happy about it. And you're not going to have good health. So uh, if you could, you know, watch out for that, um, you know, tying your bike to a tree, I get it. I don't want to lose your bike, but if there's got to be a better place to tie your bike to a tree over time, like um, Aaron had said, death by a thousand cuts, all those little cuts in the tree, old insects to get into that tree. And before you know it, we've got a problem. Um, yeah. Other things, you know, just don't be too concerned about the leaves. You know, I, I mean, I know the leaves are messy, but I think we're actually a little bit too clean in our world sometimes with our leaves. The leaves are the nutrients that those trees actually drop back into the ground so they can take that back up. Now, it doesn't look nice when you have leaves all over your, your garden, but try to use those leaves in a better way than just raking them up and throwing them away. Um, I try anyway, and I know my wife isn't too happy all the time with my leaves in my little garden beds, but it is uh, a natural fertilizer. Uh, it's a lot better than going to the store and spending all that money when you've got it right there. Um, let's see. And does Aaron give away trees? To, um, Aaron already talked about his program um, and where he gives away trees. Our program is we'll plant trees all over the city, wherever we have a request, but our budget is kind of small because our trees are a little bit bigger when we go with a contractor. There may be some day down the road where we can look at some uh, way to plant trees such similar to uh, Aaron's trees where they may be either bare root or something maybe not as um, uh, bulky where it costs a little bit more. So our budgets are a little bit limited. We just planted over 300 trees over the, this past year. So that, that's saying something. Uh, we're pretty excited about that. And we've got a lot of great response from uh, residents. And we're really trying to backfill locations that haven't been seeing trees for a long time. So um we're, we're kind of, this is a brand new department in a new way. Um, the, the forestry department's always been here in Quincy, but we have kind of a, a new direction here. Um, one of the big things uh, as part of all this training that I go through every year to be a, a certified arborist is um, we talk about community plans and, 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 you know, groups such as the Maggie's group, Quincy Trees, getting the, the public involved. And the more that you know, the more that you'll care, the more that you'll be part of things. Um, so this is what we're trying to accomplish here. This, this, this meeting process is, is great. Uh, again, uh, I wish it was in person so we could have, you know, a little get to know each other kind of thing, but we'll get there. 
Uh, I think this has been a tough year for a tree warden because I really do like getting out and meeting people. So you don't really know who I am when I'm covered with a mask and just coming around. I'm the guy in the bright green jacket or, you know, driving around the green truck, but, uh, definitely, uh, you know, stop me. If you see me, I'll be more than happy to talk with you. And, uh, I say we uh, move back on with uh, uh, either Clayton or Maggie and take some questions. Thank you so much, everybody. That those were really great talks, um, both Aaron and, and Chris, and of course Pamela from before. Um, I I think I'm going to do the questions because um, Clayton's email is a little bit. Uh, I mean, web connection is a little bit glitchy. So um, maybe I'll start with one of the last ones first because it just kind of builds on what you were just saying, Chris. Um, Hannah mentioned, can we do more to engage residents on streets that are getting new trees to help water, et cetera, and to tell residents to quit parking on the routes? All these points need to be in brochures distributed to homeowners and renters. So um, we do try to engage. And when I go out in the field, uh, when I'm in inspecting a tree for whatever, I, I have this little green card and I write some notes on it. Uh, I can tell you this. Um, one of the new things for me is coming to a community where there is a, a, a big language barrier. Um, one of the things that my boss has asked me to do is I, I feel like I'm not reaching out to the Asian community enough. Uh, this is all written in English and that's unfortunate. We really should be reaching out to these, these folks because I know there's a lot of them that are really concerned about, you know, why are you taking all my trees and I'm not seeing anything being put back. Or why are you putting that back in that location? So I really needed to figure out how to communicate better. Um, so we are definitely trying to communicate better. Uh, again, I'm, I get emails all the time. I'm responding to people. Um, it's been just, I'd say this first year has been very difficult, um, especially, you know, under the circumstances of getting to know people. Uh, and you can't really get people in big groups together. So it's, we're just kind of, in a holding pattern right now, but we'll get back to it for certain. But uh, we're going to try to build our, our website as well, the forestry webpage, so you'll be able to go there for information. Um, I just say, uh, if you're interested in trees, you can reach out to, to my office and we'll be more than happy to speak with you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the um, beginning. And the first question was how um, for Chris, how much are you governed by um, Quincy's tree ordinance? Maybe you could just give a little brief spiel about what the tree ordinance says. Um, sure. So, so the tree ordinance was passed, I, I believe, back in the 90s. In fact, I just had it over here on my desk because I was working with somebody. So the tree ordinance is, it's interesting in the fact that it's, it works in tandem with the building department. When a building permit is sought by a resident and that property is going to be developed, an existing property, you may have a house and you just wanna put an addition on your garage or something, and there's a tree in the way. If it's over eight inches in diameter and you have a building permit, then you need to come talk with me and you need to mitigate for that, excuse me, that tree's lost by either planting new trees on your location worked out with me and you have a tree mitigation plan and it doesn't have to be necessarily written up by an engineer, but we work it out together and we figure out the right spots for that tree. Or you can donate money to an account that we'll use to plant trees within your neighborhood. So I've had to do uh, work with this a little bit. Uh, this has been a tough year, not a lot of building going on, but in the locations that ha there have been building, I have some, uh, some uh, folks that I've been working with to make sure that uh, trees are being replaced accordingly. So um, that ordinance is a very powerful tool. Um, I look forward to educating the public a little bit more on how it should be used so that it isn't such a, a surprise and a shock thing. Cause a lot of times when that building permit goes out and then the building department is saying, you know, you gotta go call the tree warden too. Nobody really plans for that in advance. So the more I can educate the public, this is really a painless thing because a lot of people, you really want that landscaping in your yard. You don't, and I'm not asking you to plant, you know, a full grown, if you're taking away a 24 inch tree, you don't have to, you know, bring in a flatbed and a 24 inch tree 
plant a couple different trees in some strategic locations that in time will fill in the space of potentially what that crown was. So um, it's a powerful tool, but I think that right now uh, not enough of the uh, community knows what it's all about. And I, I need to do a better job of that. Thank you so much. Um, question for Pam. Um, can you talk a little bit about why mature trees are um, so effective at, at taking, at, at fighting climate change compared to Sure. So trees in general do a lot of good things and, and they do some things more when they're young and some when they're older. So if you look at growth rates of trees, if you think about a tree in a forest, it when it's germinating from a seed, it's trying to climb to the top of the canopy as fast as it possibly can so it could reach the sunlight, capture carbon and grow faster. So their growth rates tend to be the highest when they're young. So all else being equal, if you're just trying to capture carbon out of the atmosphere to mitigate climate change, you want a lot of young plants that are just growing as quickly as possible. But that's for the rate of carbon capture. If you want to have a lot of carbon capture, you want to keep those trees healthy that are already mature because they've already had a lifetime of, hold, of taking up carbon. And it's true, you know, on an annual basis, they might not take up as much carbon anymore, but they're holding on to such a large amount, cutting them down and either burning them or doing other things to them isn't a good thing. Um, and so also large trees, especially in a city, do an amazing job, as long as they're not causing problems that Chris brought up. Um, if they're not causing problems, then they often will do a really good job of shading. So we all know temperatures go way down if you're walking down a shady street in summer compared to one that's bare. Um, and they, like I said in my talk, they also can lower temperatures just through the process of them taking up water and that water evaporating out of their leaves. So it really depends on the process you're looking at. But large tree, they all are great. But I'd say if you can keep larger trees healthy and keep them going and there isn't a safety issue, I'd say keep them. There's no reason to replace a mature tree unless there's a concern for people's safety or well-being. And another question, um, are tree hearings optional or mandatory? For Chris. Sorry about that. I just had to unmute. Okay. Um, so tree warden, tree here, for instance, a, uh, uh, a resident wants to cut down a street tree um, because they want to widen their driveway. Uh, and that tree is a perfectly fine tree. The tree just doesn't come down. It, it has to go through the tree hearing process. It, by law, it has to. Um, some people may be a little bit confused when they see trees coming down on their street after they receive the little green card, of course, but no hearing was ever held. The, those trees are coming down because I've deemed them a high risk for some problem. Uh, and that's what I actually write on the card. Um, tree hearings are for more for when when uh, if you're driving down the street, you look at that tree and you say, well, that's a perfectly fine tree. It, why is it coming down? I recognize that. and I want you to understand. Or if a developer wants to come in and, hey, we have to make a curb cut here and we've got to cut down this street tree or, um, you know, somebody just doesn't want the tree. You know, I just that's not the way it works. We don't just cut down the tree because we'd be cutting them down. One of the big problems I've got here in Quincy, and this isn't just a Quincy problem. This is anywhere in the metro area, anywhere in an urban area is tree roots getting into old clay sewer pipes and then people's uh, sewer backing up into their home. That's not the tree's fault. You've got a faulty pipe. So you've got to get that pipe fixed. So if you want to go forward with that tree hearing, the city has no interest in taking down the tree because it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, you you could be on the hook for the, the removal of the tree, the removal of the stump, and then after roots and grows into your pipe, you're going to get another backup. And then you still have to replace the pipe. So tree hearings are mandatory thing for sure. Uh, but I won't just take down a tree. Just, I won't have a hearing just because someone says there's leaves in my gutter. Let's take down the tree. I'm not going to have a hearing for that. It's just a waste of time. It's, it's because these trees are uh, being scrutinized for some reason. And we really need the public to understand why the consideration is going out there for their removal. So um, there was actually a question about um, waste pipes. So I'll, I'll skip over that one because you handled it. Um, I think for Aaron, um, we have a private community plot on the waterfront. Could we get any advice on what to plant, even though we don't qualify as a single residence, but want to contribute environmentally? So I guess, could they call you to get advice on plantings? Yes, yeah, chatted with folks who um, are not in our planting zone 
who have wanted trees. If they're in our planting zone, um, even if it's a multi-resident building, that is, doesn't disqualify them. We, we plant in, we planted at apartment buildings, we planted at condo buildings before in our zone and some right along the, along the, uh, along the marsh. That's a, a very tricky place to plant. There's not a lot of trees that, that really like to be right up against the salt water. Um, a lot of coastal salt marshes naturally don't really have that many trees. Um, so some of the trees that we see that have done well, uh, there's a few oaks that tolerate salt very well, the white oak family in particular. Um, that choke cherry I, I showed everyone is a pretty good one. Uh, we've been using a bald cypress uh, in some of those spots and seeing how it does. That's a, that's a, um, a really a southern tree, but has a very wide range of habitat that grows from Florida, Louisiana, Gulf Coast, all the way up to here, uh, all along the coast. So it does well in kind of floody areas. So depending on exactly what the situation was, exactly what, where it was in relation to the water, a building, a view, um, that kind of stuff, um, I, I, I would be happy to, you know, help someone brainstorm uh, a tree. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly, the closer you get to the salt water, the, the palette uh, of options goes down for sure. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then a question from Mike and Cindy. Um, is there a problem with trees harmed by gas leaks here in Quincy? I think um, I'll take that one. Um, so gas leaks will harm a tree anywhere. Um, I've only come across one gas leak so far where it was impacting a tree over on Harvard street. Um, uh, the resident called me, it was a newer tree too. It probably only been in the ground maybe about three or four years as young red maple. Uh, she called me out and the coloring in the leaf was starting to, uh, it was starting to fade. It was an interesting look. Um, and so I did a little dig. It was planted a little too deep too. I was did a little digging. And as I was digging, there was more gas coming out of the soil. So uh, I had the resident call National Grid. They were out there. They, they fixed the gas leak that they found. And the tree was doing great in the fall. But right before the, the leaves started to go back to a different color. And it was fantastic. So all I would say is National Grid has been very nice to work with me. I haven't worked so much with the gas uh, utility side uh, other than the electrical side, but they're all one big company. So I would say that if you've got a concern that you're smelling gas and there's a tree around you, give me a call or give National Grid a call. I'd say call National Grid first and then call me after the fact and I can work with them. Um, but uh, it's definitely, it's a problem everywhere, uh, all around our area. Um, Anytime we get a frost or a, uh, a flood or whatever, the gas pipes are moving in the ground. So um, it's a big deal. And, and gas will kill a tree in pretty short time. So definitely something we want to keep our eye on. Okay, Chris, um, we have more for you, actually. So um, would you be able to, after I finish asking you these questions, put in the chat like a number um, that people could call if they do you have a concern about a tree in Quincy? I'd say actually I'll, what I'll do is I'll put my email address because mm -hmm. a lot of times when you call me, I'm going to be outside. I'm out in the field and I can actually uh, reply. I may be in right near you close so I could just even come by and take a look. So uh, what I could do is, and, and you can find my email address on the city's website too. So if you, you, if mm -hmm. you need it here or wherever, we can figure that out. Yeah. Trees are removed every year. Well, since I've only worked here one year, I can say that we removed about 250 trees last year. And I'll say this, that sounds like a really high number. And the goal is to always plant more than you're removing. The trees that we did remove, and I wish I could share my screen. Unfortunately, my computer is extremely slow and I didn't want to crash the whole system here. That the trees that we're taking down are in really tough shape. Um, one of the things that was told to me when I first started here is, you know, we've got a, we've got about 25, at least we understand we have about 25,000 street trees in Quincy. That's at least that's our thought. I'm currently in the process of putting together an inventory. I just uh, inventoried about 2,500 trees in this past year, which may not seem like a lot when it's 25,000, but believe me, it's, it's a lot of trees, 2,500 trees, a lot of trees. Um, I, I'd say that, um, 250 trees isn't so bad when you think about where these trees are living on the sides of the street and the different things that they have to put up with 
And unfortunately, um, the management of this forest in the past was more uh, reactive than proactive. Um, without saying anything bad about the past forestry department in Quincy, I'm just saying that now we're trying to be more forward thinking and we're getting rid of the trees that are constantly being called into our office. Another branch fell out. Another thing happened here. This tree is leaning now. And we're looking at all these trees and we're realizing that there's not much we can do to save them. They're not, they're becoming high risk. Some of them have been on tree wardens. I've had uh, tree hearings. I've had two tree hearings since I've started working here. Um, so you're going to see trees removed in the city and you're going to see trees removed in the healthiest of urban forests because we want to be proactive uh, and make sure that public safety is our number one thing. So we removed about 250 trees in one year. I'm hoping that in 2021, it doesn't have to be that bad that we've gotten rid of a lot of the bad eggs and that we can go forward with really starting to maintain the rest that we've got. We're still going to have to remove some. I just uh, assessed a whole bunch of trees over in the Reservoir Ave, Forbes Hill Road area the other day. And there were six trees right there that, you know, over the years, a utility company had, you know, taken too much out of, or you could see where a new driveway went in or some new curbing went in and the trees were all damaged. And now you're looking at like two or three branches and they're all full of cavities and mushrooms. And what am I supposed to do with that? So we are still taking down trees. I'm just hoping that the number will start to come down and the planting number and those healthy trees is going to go up. Um, I think um, I think Clayton put your email in the chat to everybody. So um, thank you. And then looks like a lot of these questions are for you, Chris. So um, you're going to be busy. Let's see. Is there a more effective way to make sure that yard waste Christmas trees are collected properly in dedicated trucks to be composted rather than picked up by regular trash and just go to landfills? So um, I can't speak to that too much because I'm not involved in that process. That's all through DPW. I can tell you this, though, those trash trucks that are picking up the trees, they are actually dumping the trees into a large pile out of the DPW. Uh, Aaron, you may have seen, well, you don't work so much here planting trees in the, in the wintertime, but you may have uh, seen some <laughs> of that pile up there. And, yeah, and I know our, that we keep our trees behind the area in the city yard behind those huge piles. I, yeah. I've seen those huge, huge recycling yards. Piles. So they're not necessarily going to a landfill with the rest of the trash. They're actually going to a tub grinder and they're all chipped out uh, because it's such a mess of different types of trees and decay. And, you know, from the branches that have fallen down through storms and, and then the Christmas trees gets piled on that. Uh, I don't currently know where those chips go after the fact. But I can look into that and that could be something that, you know, you could email me and, you know, as long as the DPW, well, you know, wants to explain that to me. But, uh, you know, there are there are places, I, at least I know, used to know places within the state that would use those chips to either uh, fuel uh, greenhouses. You know, they uh, fuel like furnaces to heat greenhouses. Uh, um, there's a bunch of places that do use those chips so that we're not just putting them in a the landfill and burying them for, you know, all time that uh, they're actually being used again. So. Okay. Um, and then another question. Um, why were all the trees on Newport Avenue around Wollaston T Station cut down? I thought if roadways are wide, the sidewalks can be extended. Um, I can't say that I uh, worked on that project. I don't know when that took place. Uh, I've been working within the neighborhoods off of Newport Ave, uh, but I haven't done I think I've taken down one tree on Newport Ave right at the corner of Elmwood. Uh, it was completely dead. Do you have a plan for replacing trees in the neighborhoods and not just planting in parks and public spaces? Most of our trees are planted in the neighborhoods um, because we have so many requests throughout the city that we try to hold off maybe about 10 to 15 trees and plant those in the parks. But out of the 330 trees we just planted, most of those are street trees. Uh, we only planted a, a couple here and there in some of the parks. Oh, so there were a couple questions about the um, tree assessments um, and the urban forest management plan. So uh, somebody asked, um, can you tell us more about the urban forest management plan 
um, and these tree assessments. And then someone else asked, "Is there? Would you like any help from citizens to do this um, inventory that you were talking about?" Yeah. So what, one of the things that I've been uh, tasked to do is an inventory of all the trees in the city. I haven't quite figured out how I could get um, a volunteer group to help me with this because as I'm doing it, I'm also assessing it for risk, which I don't necessarily think that everyone is, uh, you know, they don't have the background for it. They're not saying anything bad about anyone. You know, everyone knows what a healthy tree looks like, but there are certain things that I'm looking for and certain things that I know that my guys can fix. So as I'm inventorying, I'm creating work at the same time. So where there are other communities in this area, and I know many different tree wardens that build an inventory. That's it. Just what do we have right here, right now? Not how do we make that a working inventory to work with our crews? Um, I don't know how we could do that just yet. Um, I could probably work with my commissioner that, but you'd, I think that the certain individuals that would work with me would have to be, have some type of experience and maybe they, I think someone said in that question that maybe they could be trained or something. And then separately from the, these questions, I know that um, I, a biology professor at ENC, the Eastern Nazarene college. And um, he was saying that his biology students would love to work on projects if possible. So there could be some, you know, some, some student, student help as well if that would be useful at all it's very possible that we could do something in the parks that we have we have many beautiful parks around the city um where i'm not really getting into the parks because i've got such a demand from from my time out on the streets that maybe i could work with someone in the parks about that that's something i'd, I'd still have to work out uh although i've been here a year it seems like a long time for a lot of people it's been like a blink of an eye for me basically uh so uh there's still a lot that i'm trying to build uh here in this department. And, uh, um, and again, where this year has been so kind of squashed, um, there's, we have plenty of room to grow. So let me uh, try to think of how I could work that out. Okay. Another question, where's the conservation land in Quincy? I was surprised to see some scraggly trees behind a house near all the Quarry Street developments called conservation land. I don't know if that's a question more for the conservation commission or um, potentially our environmental scientist, who's my colleague. I, I was the former director of conservation Needham and the conservation agent Watertown. And I'm currently, I serve on the Braintree conservation commission. So I, I know an awful lot about it, but I, my job here in Quincy hasn't been to, um, you know, uh, keep a, an eye out for the conservation land. So, Conservation land could mean a, a couple different things. It could mean, is it subject to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act? Or has it been deemed conservation land with a restriction? Is it owned by the Conservation Commission? So there's many different things. Uh, if it's behind, you know, if it's like next to a, 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 a marsh, then it's, you know, regulated by the Mass Wetlands Protection Act, not necessarily considered conservation land, but it, it's regulated land. So I think that that might be a question for the Conservation Commission, maybe a little bit more than me. Okay. I'm not quite sure I understand Janet's question. Um, so Janet, we maybe um, you can send another version of it. She asks, if someone wants to remove a tree just because you don't want it, I'm gonna to have to let you know. Um, so I don't know who, I'm not sure exactly. But I, I think I know what that question is all about. The question is like, uh, so th th if, if a person is dead set on something, th they, could go about taking down the tree, right? They could hire someone, a, a company that uh, doesn't care about the law. It's just, it's, it's breaking the law, basically. You're breaking the law. You're breaking the Public Shade Tree Act. If you take down a public tree without the tree warden's involvement, you've broken the law. So all I would say is, if anybody is considering removing a publicly owned tree, contact me first. Because if you do get found out, you could be fined. So you, you, you don't want to have to deal with that. Um, Mary Lou asks, there's an area next to Black's Creek that we always called Pine Woods. There are several trees that have fallen down in that area. Are they going to be cleared? Well, this is the first I'm hearing about that. But I would say this, that because so much of my attention is on street trees, 
I do have an awful concern for forested areas and uh, especially when it comes to pathways that are being blocked, but it's not, unfortunately, I, I just have to say, because if they're in a forested area and there's a tree on the ground, that can't be a priority for me based on the resources I have uh, at my disposal with a tree crew of four to maybe six guys. I'm tapped out every day with street tree work. Um, and that's something that we'll have to talk a little bit more about going in the future. And Pam, maybe you want to address that a little bit. If there's trees down in a kind of forested area of Quincy, um, would it just be better to leave those for so that they can decay for animals and stuff like what? Yeah, dead wood is a huge component of natural ecosystems. As long as it's or damaging pipes, I'd say leave it because you're right. It's it's a source of carbon and nutrients and so many. Th I mean, there's a whole natural successional process that happens when a tree dies. That's just part of the life cycle of a forest. Fungi take over. You'll see them growing. Um, bacteria take over, and then you get new plants growing. And so, yeah, if it can be, if they can be left, that would be great for everybody. Okay, great. So maybe we'll just do a couple more questions and then we'll see if any of you had final thoughts and we'll wrap it up. Um, but um, Aaron quickly, or comments, my tree line street is quickly fading. In the last year, two have been cut down in one block. The street is all asphalt and sidewalk. Can other trees be planted if there are no areas of soil or grass? So... so this is going back to the right tree, the right place, and then site suitability. Um, we can we can make locations to plant trees, but I'm very hesitant to just cut a, a, a square in some asphalt surrounded you know area with no pervious, no air, no water or nutrients getting to these tree roots. So I could come out to that area and take a look and see if there's other residents that'd be interested. Um, depending on the, the part of the, the town that, it, that it's in, maybe Aaron's uh, project uh, might be able to meet with that uh, person. Um, but we do, we have in this past year tried to build in uh, planting pits uh, a little bit wider, um, four by five feet, four by six feet in some cases. And we've also tried to add um, planting strips down the side of the road to get a little bit more infiltration. So in those places, we wouldn't necessarily plant trees like oaks or, you know, big maples as such, but maybe some uh, flowering cherries, service berry trees like that. Uh, you'll get that flowering habit. You'll get uh, some wildlife uh, function value. So um, we could do that. But uh, again, one of the big things we don't want to do is just just stuff a tree in a spot and hope that it's going to work. We really want to give it, you know, a good place to really spread its roots. Okay. All right, so maybe there's actually just one last question. So we'll get, I think, all of them in, hopefully. Um, should we water older street trees in a drought or just the younger ones? From Elizabeth. I, I'd like to hear uh, everyone's, uh, t not just from me. I I'd like to hear from uh, Pamela and Aaron on that. But I'll just say this. Um, the, the younger trees obviously uh, need it so much more the bigger trees are really tapped in. They've found their water sources to be, to get to be that big. They, they know how to get the water. It's the younger trees that really need it. We don't want those little root hairs to dry up. So I'd like to hear what uh, our other uh, colleagues have to say here. Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with Chris on, the, you know, the, the big trees to put, you know, often being really, uh, more established and um, unless it's like a really extreme drought, often they don't, they don't often need it. I usually tell folks, we usually tell folks, you know, after a year two or three, um, the trees typically don't need regular additional watering in, you know, but we are starting to see more droughts. Um, we had one in 2016 that was pretty significant. We had one this past summer that was quite significant. Uh, very dry in Quincy. We were doing a bunch of street tree watering. And uh, yeah, those two, three, those young trees, four or five year old trees, uh, they can dry out pretty quickly. And uh, a dry root is a dead root. It's not great. Uh, so we add, um, that's how we, we build those little saucers to help, you know, harvest any kind of rain around there, but also make it, make it easy for someone to uh, empty a bucket or leave a hose at the base or something like that. And um, I, I sometimes 
tell folks, you know, make it part of trash day routine. Put the hose out around the tree, turn it on a little bit, take the trash out, and, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, you can turn off the hose and wrap it back up. And, you know, it's going to give it a little bit of water once a week kind of thing. Uh, it's nice and helpful. Great. Um, Pam, did you have anything to add or? I think they covered it well. <laughs> the younger the tree, the more vulnerable. Yep. Do you, does, does anyone have any final thoughts they'd like to add? Any of our panelists? Um, I just want to uh, touch on one the, uh, the last question for Chris about the about the trees in the front um, and about how the, the 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 pits that they're cutting and trying to get them in. Um, when I, we sometimes deal with streets like that where the street has been uh, used to have trees, they're they're gone or are in decline, uh, and folks want their trees back. And sometimes there's not enough not enough space to get a good tree back, and so. Uh, we I'd like to talk to folks about planting a setback tree, uh, where we, instead of planting it in a two by three foot or four by five foot cut out of the of the pavement, uh, we just put it on the other side of the sidewalk, in the in someone's yard. Um, we can use a, a similar small tree in one or the other, but the yard is going to have way more root space. Uh, it's going to do better in times of drought. Um, so we call that a setback tree. I think that there are shade tree laws about it um, and chapter 87 stuff. I think that uh, Chris has some has some leeway on that kind of stuff, but uh, folks are usually pretty responsive and we've, we've got a lot of trees in the ground doing that very right? same thing where there's just, where's the space? Yep. It's, it, sometimes it's not there. Yeah, I was going on a walk today and I noticed um, some really old kind of asphalt sidewalks that were just really in bad shape. And I thought, geez, if the city ever, you know, just takes these out and, and puts a new sidewalk in, it'd be great to add like a tree strip um, there that wasn't there. Um, but anyway, um, actually just if we have, apparently two people asked this question at the same time. So this is a high demand question. Who manages those bags we see attached to newly planted trees on the sidewalk? Please tell us about the green bags around the trunks of new trees. And that will be our last question. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I can say first and foremost, I get a lot of questions on this, that um, they are purchased by the city. Uh, and I don't know if Aaron is putting those bags on his trees or not. Uh, you are? Some. some okay. Some, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have, uh, as part of our contract with our uh, tree provider, we um, have those bags installed. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing since I came into the city is the bags were always installed around the tree. And that, that's the way they're designed to put around the base of the tree. Well, I'm part of the Massachusetts Tree Wardens and Forest Association, and, and I'm really involved with that association and I have a lot of friends that are the tree wardens in the metro area and one of the things that we noticed when we were uh, going on a site walk in one community that had just started to do this was as we're just picking up these bags they were collecting the water behind the bag condensation was taking place behind the bag because of the difference in temperature in the summertime and that water is sitting on the trunk of the tree so as I I went to unzip one and like three or four different kind of creepy crawlies just went running away that were actually gnawing on the tree. So we determined that, you know, we're really just looking for that water to get into the soil. It doesn't necessarily have to be right on top of the, the root ball. The tree's roots are going to find that water if it's there. So we've been putting the bag on the stake, which is only about a foot and a half away from the tree. So I get a lot of phone calls here in my office. Hey, you big dummy. <laughs> what are you doing putting the tree? You're supposed to put it on the tree. But that's not the case, though. It doesn't really matter where it is as long as it's within close proximity to those roots. And if anyone can tell, you know, tell me that I'm doing a bad thing, but me and a handful of other tree wardens have found a lot of success with that. So, so we do manage them, but we do also ask, look, if you go out there and that bag's empty, if you could help fill us, fill it up, we'd really appreciate it. And so wouldn't the tree. Great. Um, well, I just want to thank everyone so much for all of this wonderful information. Um, it's, it's really fantastic and, and for your time. Um, I think everybody's really learned a lot. So I guess we 
Shall we end it, Clayton? I yeah, I think that is it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Pam, Chris, Aaron, Maggie, thank you so much for, for sharing so much expertise and, and, and just passion uh, for the trees that we have in the city. Uh, we've gotten lots of accolades across the chats, uh, and I know this has really been appreciated by a lot of people tonight. Uh, we've had a great turnout and, and great energy. I really appreciate everybody sticking with and asking such engaging questions. Mm -hmm.